Hi guys. All right, so this is 100 Days Studio on the Architecture Foundation um, Instagram Live, and this is Bedtime Stories, um, curated by Alicia Pavaro. Um, and I'm Maria Smith, and I'm gonna read Between the Conceits by Will Self. Um, and he wrote this story in London nearly 30 years ago, when London was a slightly different place. All right, get comfortable. Um, I think it'll take about 20 minutes or so to read the whole story and then that's the whole story. So you might as well tune in till the end. Okay. There are only eight people in London and fortunately, I am one of them. Of course, when I make that statement, I don't mean to be taken literally, heaven forbid, and that would be worse still, I shouldn't want you to think that I'm a snob of any kind. To discriminate between people on the basis of birth is inimical to me, always has been. I simply couldn't engage in that sort of conceit. I can declare with some authority that there simply isn't a snobbish bone in my entire body. If there was, I would feel quite confident that the good egalitarian tissue encasing it would tense up like the lining of a chomping mouth and spit the slimy thing out without more ado. There you have it in a nutshell. I should sooner be filleted than have it thought by you that I wish to elevate myself in some spurious, unmerited fashion. But all this being noted, the fact does remain that there are only eight people in London. Eight people who count, that is. Eight people who matter. I still find it strange to say this. So very strange to imagine, for example, that someone like Dooley, funny that his name should occur quite so readily, counts for anything at all, even to some long-lost great niece or old army mate. What could the likes of Dooley possibly represent, save for an embarrassment? Even his family, I know that he had one at one time, must have felt that being closely related to Dooley was like being trapped next to someone on a long plane flight and having them force a glancing acquaintance into intimacy. Furthermore, Dooley smells, of that much I'm certain. Not that I know exactly where he lives, but I have narrowed it down to a particular grid of Victorian artisans' cottages in Lower Clapton. I can picture him in one of those ticky-tacky rabbit warrens readily enough. But I don't so much see him as sent him, reclining on a broken down daybed with layer after layer of urine damp underwear compressed between his jaundiced arse and worn nap of an old army blanket. I can guess as well that all around him, resting on tables and chairs, the tops of heaters, the mantelpiece and the floor, there will be pots of prescription drugs, sedatives, hypnotics, tranquilizers. For Dooley is a neurotic of the old school. He wouldn't be able to survive without such gross nostrums. Of course, the reason why I don't know exactly where Dooley lives is because I don't want to. I don't want to know the precise location of any of them. Some might say that this is because I want to hold fast my cherished illusion. But what does this illusion amount to, really? That such and such a time I might choose to see myself a little bit more than an equal? A third amongst eight, rather than simply as one of eight? Well, why not? I've never attempted to elevate myself above Lady Bob or the recorder, but by the same token, token, I'll never concede an iota of distinction to Lechmere, Colin Purves or the Bollum sisters. They could all rot in hell before I would give them one, one of them the satisfaction of believing that I could think them quality. And of course, it's the same for them. I know, it's crazy. Crazy that the Bollum sisters, these virtually psychotic twins from St. Nevis who sit all day, every day in a Stratton bedsit knitting dolls of the Redeemer and who share a bizarre kind of joint mind, speaking in unison, prescience and so forth, should despite everything feel capable of feeling slighted socially. As if anyone would ever invite those two to any social function whatsoever. A turkey plucker's whist drive is as elevated and rarefied in respect to the Bollum sisters as one of Lady Bob's soirees would be for Dooley. Yet, that being noted, it is an index of just how repugnant everything Dooley does is that even these two weirdo humanoid knitting machines are still concerned to distance themselves from him. So it goes on. We all tiptoe around one another, dancing our little dance, the two-step of arrogance and conceit. One of us will orchestrate a calculated snub and then the rest of us will respond. There will be a reproachment, an olive branch offered by one or perhaps two of us. A new clique will be constructed on the basis of mutually assured destruction. 
would be believing it at the time. Believe that this collusion of interest is forever, as thick as family blood that has coagulated over centuries. Yet invariably, it will all be picked away within days, weeks at the outside, creating a ragged, exposed patch, a new area of potential healing. Just occasionally, the, these manoeuvres will get something like serious. There's a particular L-shaped axis of cliqueness that is dangerous. It begins with the Bollum sisters, snags in Lechmere, the insipid, compliant dunderhead. And then, and then, and you really would have thought this would immediately act as a limpet, mine planted on the very hull of their social ambition, the three of them would start extending their feelers towards Dooley. Dooley, what a joke, what a sick bloody joke. So think of it, the Bollum sisters people, many thousands of them, at least 150,000 individuals, would be required. Approaching Dooley's people at cocktail parties, union meetings, in bars and restaurants, then, figuratively speaking, offering up to Dooley's lot the baboon's arse of acknowledged inferiority in some crude way that even Dooley's people can understand. 147,000 invitations here, 270,000 confidences there, a myriad fatuous compliments in the middle. It doesn't matter. Perhaps 20 or 30,000 of Lechmere's people will be deployed as well to write grovel letters or open doors. It should be funny because they haven't a hope in hell of achieving anything. The minute they start deploying their people, like they drag them down to Dooley's level rather than yanking his sots, mooches and social security claimants up to theirs. But what I don't find funny at all is the way that this appears to place Colin Purves and me in some sort of clubbable relation to one another. Not that I dislike Colin Purves. In his own way, he has a certain, albeit narrow, sympathy. It's just that he's more rentier characters traits make him utterly and incontrovertibly unsuitable company for someone of Lady Bob's breeding. What little progress I have made with Lady Bob over the years would be shot to pieces if she were ever to suspect that Colin Purves and I were anything more than acquaintances. Not that she would do anything crass, like have her people actively cut my people. It's just that I can imagine, visualise even, the tiny individual crystals of hoarfrost that would begin to coalesce around her sense of fraud were towards me. She is that subtle and refined a person. But I feel genuine venom to any particular individual over the way this scenario plays itself out. It's towards Lechmere. Lechmere who should know better. Lechmere who should be capable of being more steadfast. Lechmere who has pretensions towards a higher class of refinement. What with his collection of old silverware and his hunting prints, Lechmere leaning against this in invitation encrusted mantelpiece, hands plunged deep into his grey flannel bags so he can jingle with his small change of maiden aunts, titled Second Cousins. Lechmere, who has the faint, but for all that distinct, whiff of new money about him. This was dumped on him by a stepfather of all people. A stepfather who made his money in construction of all things. Construction. Well, my dear, the word itself has a put-together feel about it. So, you see, I cannot cede anything to Lechmere in the way of handicapping, even through the face of it. On the face of it, he's closer to Lady Bob and the recorder. I believe many, many of their respective people are on the Christian name terms than I am. For the truth of the matter is that he has secrets of his own to protect. If only Lechmere's stepdaddy could have seen the uses his money has been put to, Lechmere gave up his job at the Treasury, toot sweet. Now he fritters his time away between the book, Buccanistas on the Farringdon Road and those cheechy little antique joints on Camden Passage. Can you squeeze in a little closer towards me? That's it. Lean forward. Because this really is intended for your ears alone. I would only dream of vouchsafing this to someone like yourself. Someone with whom I have struck up an immediate rapport. Someone who's a good listener. Further, you can take it as read that for me to divulge an intimate suspicion of this order is tantamount to my assuming that a corresponding intimacy exists between the two of us. Anyway, the nub of it is this. I suspect Lechmere of being a practicing homosexual. You don't seem shocked. Well, of course, I, su I suppose you know nothing of all this, but let me tell you that among the eight of us, it's common knowledge that more of Lechmere's people are homosexual than anyone else's. 15,394, to be precise. 
What's more, I know that he has a fair few voyeurs on his books. No, damn it, that's the core of my suspicion. Lechmere's voyeurs. When I mull it over, I don't think Lechmere's homosexuals are either here nor there. After all, we, we all have our homosexuals. I have over half a million practising and getting on for a quarter of a million latent. But bloody useful they are at times. I, I wouldn't want to be without mine. They give more parties in the straits. They're excellent for close, subtle work, the spreading of malicious gossip, the Chinese whispering of slurs and the making of just the right kind of insinuations. Spend a great deal more time on their office, office politics to boot. So, you see, I've nothing against a, a toad in the hole, even if he's one of Lechmitz. No, no, the thing is the voyeurs. Why has Lechmitz acquainted, acquired so many voyeurs, so many people who like to watch? The only answer I can come up with is that some deep and magical level of thought he feels that if he can watch us more than we watch him, we won't be able to find out what he's doing with his pork sword. Personally, I'm rather stunned that he still has the energy for it. What's more, I'm sure that it corrupts his vision as far as dis dictating the more subtle movements of his people are concerned. If he's bumping and boring around like that, leaning over some bloody rent boy, how can he conceivably be alive to the nuances of 2,947 unreturned phone calls or 45,709 bad birthday presents, let alone 17,578,582 gestures of dismissal? This work demands attention. Being one of the only eight people in London is like some massive game of Go. No, Go isn't the right analogy at all because people, whether controlled or not, are no mere counters. Each one, after all, has his or own potentiality. It would be worse than pointless to deploy 4,732 throat-cutting gestures were what was required a mere 219 diplomatic overtures by the right people. No, perhaps a better way of understanding it is chess. But then chess isn't played by eight players using 13 million pieces between them. Who could possibly quantify the permutations that such a game represents? The Googleplex available moves. I've heard it said that the brains of grandmasters are uncoupled from time as ordinary people understand it, that the many, many thousands of calculations they make, gambits they follow through, could only take place parallel to one another, like the many little rivulets of thought running down some hillside of cognition. Pa, I make more such calculations in an hour than Kasparov does in a year. I stretch, then relax, and 35,665 white-collar workers leave their houses a teensy bit earlier for work. This means that 6,014 6, of them will feel dyspeptic during the journey because they've missed their second piece of toast or bowl of fruit and fibre, from which it follows that 2,982 of them will be testy throughout the morning, and therefore 312 of them will say the wrong thing, leading to dismissal, hence one of these 312 will lose the balance of his reason and commit an apparently random and motiveless murder on the way home. Now, to compute this, together with all the side issues, is unbelievably difficult, for this is not merely aimed at producing the effect of one homicide. Oh no, there are many different outcomes that follow on from such a scenario. It isn't so much a decision tree as a decision forest, with branches parting and parting and parting into twigs that divide and divide and divide again, some of them only then coming to fruition. It takes more than mere brain power, though, to undertake such infinitely subtle and ramified calculations. It takes a kind of flair, an ability to think laterally and then zoom around a corner, an innate tendency to perceive the tactical move that one of the other seven hasn't grasped. A good example of this is the massive double, triple, quadruple, all the way to, to non upple bluffs that we all engage in, particularly on bank holidays. Naturally, would always Naturally, one would always like at least some of one's people to be able to get out of town on a bank holiday. See a little green grass, frolic with a few sheep, even splash off the shingle at Brighton or Shoreham. But at the same time, one knows that a bank holiday with more than an hour spent in heavy traffic is worse than no bank holiday at all. Especially if we're talking of people who have children. If this is to be the case, it's far better that one direct the greater part of one's people to stay at home if only so that a minority can gain greater utility. You see how it all shapes up. Like poker players, the eight of us assess how many others are likely to direct out of town and how many by car, how many by bus or train. Sometimes one of the eight of us will go so far as to keep all of his or her people at home. The entire bunch. 
it can have only happened once or twice. I did it about five years ago and the glee, let me tell you, the intense thrill of schadenfreude when I saw everyone else's, the Bollum sisters, Dooley, Colin Purves, Lechmere, damn it at all, even a hell of a lot of Lady Bob and the recorders people, the whole lemming load of them trapped, sweating and bored in mile after mile of tailback after tailback. But of course, mostly it isn't so straightforward. I sit there caressing my volumes and papers and discs, trying to sense the messages in the ether, the subtle modulations of intent that might indicate how some, how many of are on the move and where to. I think about Lady Bob. Will she send her people out of town? And if so, how many? Or will she, like the Bollum sisters, who are incorrigibly nervous and stay at home, respond to the numerous notices of roadworks on major routes and have been coming in all week and leave the tarmac shimmering and empty so that my lot can make the dash? Alternatively, Lady Bob may react like the recorder, whose fine, loyally mind often attracts him to the triple bluff. He almost always sends a fair bunch of people off on the basis that we will all think that he will think that we will think that he will think that it's not worth going. While it's true that this strategy has stood him in good stead, often allowing to him to get as many as 694,672 people out of the city for the day. At any rate, that's what he clocked last August bank holiday. I think it's as much to do with the fact that a high percentage of the recorders people debauch through the east of London, as any great tactical achievement of his part. Not that I mean to be disrespectful to the recorder, nothing is further from my mind, and why would I? After all, it is the recorder's people who have consistently increased the amount of good mornings they've bidden to my people over the past 10 years. In the early 80s, only about 900,000 of his people ever said good morning to my people, but now it's more or less averages at that level, representing a compound increase year on year of over 0.96%. Far greater, it has to be said, than the increase in salutations from ladies' bogged people. It sounds complex, doesn't it? Quite a lot to take on board. Well, that's the way I work. But the saddest thing I have to tell you is that I fear it makes hardly any difference to the outcome. Dooley isn't capable of anything like this degree of foresight and calculation, and yet I have to say that all too often, as many of his people make it out of the city on bank holidays as mine. As many of his people get late reservations as Quiglinos as mine, as many of his people get a seat on the tube as mine, it just isn't fair. Simply by adopting the tactic that is no tactic, a kind of brutish force majeure, duly imposes himself on our society. He farts and 4,209 children are beaten and buggered. He coughs and 68,238 sufferers from emphysema get promoted to cancer. He groans, turning on his daybed, and 47 of his people lose control of their vehicles and drive into the vehicles of 47 of my people. Dooley is a kind of elemental force. His weapons are pain, suffering, loneliness and deprivation. He sneezes and seven junkies overdose and squats off the Caledonian road. Not for Dooley the subtleties of the snub, the cold shoulder, the dropped gaze and the backbite. He has no need of them because he has no ambition to save to remain as he is, Lord of the Underclass. What is it with Lady Bomb? Bob, why is she so hard for me to get into work with her? Sometimes lying awake on stormy nights with the street lamps outside shining through the raindrops on the window and making a, a stippled pattern across the floor of my bedroom, I begin to get the fear. The fear that somehow Lady Bob has mixed me up in her mind with Dooley. That she hasn't been paying attention to the infinite deference with which I have courted her favour. It's my turn to toss and turn, to knead the duvet with my hands as if it were some kind of wad of sweating dough. Was it the 34,571 Valentine's Day cards that I sent to several of her many divisions of secretaries and data processing clerks? Or perhaps the 14,408 ever so slightly forward air kissing that I bestowed upon 7,204 of her hairstylists, sales assistants and gallery girls? Maybe she felt a deep lingering rancour when, for reasons that I am unable to divulge, I was obliged to break off 415 of the extramarital affairs that my people were having with hers. Who can say? But the fact remains that Lady Bob consistently invites me to fewer dinner parties than even Dooley. That smarts. That hurts. Only 210,542 invitations to meals of any sort last year. And of those, a good 40,000 were children's parties. Children's parties. I ask you. Worse still, at anything up to 22% of these parties, my kids fail to come away with a party bag. Tears before their bedtime and mine. What can I do? Any overt move would be misinterpreted. Of that much, I am sure. 
I can feel in the very limits of my seething collectivity of consciousness the peculiar inlets and isolated promontories of our interaction. The eight of us, the eight that matter, that is, are like the tectonic plates that cover the earth. If one of us rubs up against any of the others, we produce mighty forces that reverberate, affecting the other six. Given this, perhaps I would do better to concentrate my efforts on the recorder once more. In the past, I assiduously courted him. I would even have my people in the city deliberately form shooting syndicates to which the recorder's people would be invited. I made sure that the recorder's people were always asked to be godparents of my people's children. I formed a suburban philatic society just to, to be able to invite some of the recorder's loners along. If one of my people was doing a Samaritans and one of the recorders phoned in, well, you can be certain they were given an excess of sympathy, a beaming out of true caring. It was all to no avail. It wasn't so much that it didn't work. I know the recorder thinks well of me, be the good mornings. It's just that he didn't reciprocate in any meaningful fashion. Unless you count the 34,876 items of junk mail. Far more than my people have ever received from any of the other sixes lot. I don't want to have to stoop to the tactics of Lechmere and the Bottom Sisters. I don't want to have to associate with that perverse crew any more than I have to. Of course, I am protected to some degree by my covert association to Colin Purves. He's a worthy sort of chap, you know the kind, not that imaginative, plodder really. He's the only one of the eight of us who commutes. He lives down at Tunbridge Wells with his wife. He probably refers to her as my lady wife whilst propping up the saloon bar in the local pub. He takes the 822 to Charing Cross every morning and then crosses via the footbridge to his office on the South Bank. I believe he's responsible, if that's the word, responsibility seems slightly too grand, for the stationary purchasing of one department of one division of one subsidiary of a multinational oil company. Lucky for Purves, having a desk job, it means that, like me, he has an opportunity to keep, to keep close to him the London phone directories and the computer disks that hold pirated copies of all the electoral registers for London's constituencies. Of course, neither of us has to have the physical evidence of all the people we control to hand. Oh no, it's just that Purves, like myself, finds it somewhat easier to get to grips with the job if he has some kind of record of these multiplying blips of sentience. I like to hold the directory that contains the listing of the biggest chunk of the people I am manipulating at any given time. It gives me the feeling that I am in some sense holding them, caressing them, tweaking the strings that shift their little arms and little legs, their little mouths and their little heads. I don't get out a lot anymore. Tonight is an exception. It's nice to sit here in the snug of the pub and watch the people laughing and drinking. It amuses me to try and guess which of them belongs to whom. That horsey looking woman, yeah, her. The strawberry blonde with the Hermes headscarf drinking a ginger beer shandy. Well, you'd have thought she'd be Lady Bob's or the recorders, hmm? Well, you're wrong. She belongs to the Bollum sisters. I know, I know, but you see, look at the sides of her neck. That's a certain unresolved tension in the tendons. It's ever so subtle, but it's enough for me to be able to tell. The man who collects the glasses, all stooped over with his drowned rat beard and that absurd mulberry-coloured quilted smoking jacket, the lapels of which are encrusted with silly badges. Lechmere's. In fact, he's one of Lechmere's voyeurs. Particularly gruesome one, I should imagine. What's that? You're surprised it doesn't make me paranoid having him here in my local? No, no, don't be ridiculous. It matters not a jot. We co-mingle freely, all of us. There are some of the others people, some of the others people very close to me indeed. Couldn't get any closer if they tried. No, no, I used to work, but I, I gave up my job at the bookshop to look after my mother. She's almost 90 now and quite bedridden. It's a fairly quiet life that mother and I have. There's not a lot of money, but there are a lot of bedpans to empty. An exciting interlude for the two of us is a visit from the health visitor or an extra sausage from the Meals on Wheels. I suppose you, you could say that Mother and I are close, perhaps too close. I can sometimes guess what she's thinking just by looking at her. The other way around? No, I don't think so. How can I put it? Mother is just a trifle déclassé, a tiny cut below myself. And anyway, she's one of Dooley's and that really scuppers it as far as I'm concerned. It's, it's strange the way we all appear to have different motivations. Dooley acting apparently out of the capriciousness, the Bollum sisters acting out of some perverted religiosity, Lechmere trying to see everything, Perves with his desire for orderliness, directing many, many thousands of his rather dull little men to wash their cars every Saturday morning, to mow their lawns every Sunday afternoon without fail. 
As for the recorder, Lady Bob, well, I wouldn't presume, but I think I can safely say that they have everyone's best interests at heart. And then there's me. Acting, I would say, with absolute probity, attempting to make sure that there is a kind of organic unity in London, that people have their right position and estate. It's entirely appropriate that it should be me who fulfills this role, occupying, as I do, a sort of middle to upper middle niche. I can look in both directions, up and down the social scale, to check that, to the best of my abilities, everybody is in his correct place. If 212 ethnic minority local councillors throughout the capital are getting a tad stroppy, then I make it my business to ensure that they're knocked down a peg or two. What exactly? Well, I might have their children arrested for drugs, something like that. And if there are 709 little Saloni women who fancy they're about to get their name in some glossy magazine, then I'm on hand to make sure the proofreaders make the correct error. It can be still more subtle than this. In one blissful 24-hour period, a month or so ago, I engineered it so that 45,902 of my people found themselves dropping the wrong name. Good, eh? I am good. Good, good at the task in hand. It's not snobbery. I thought I told you at the outset, I deplore snobbery and it consti constitutes no part of my motivation. I simply believe that there is a natural order of people, just as there is of things, a kind of periodic table onto which every element within every person can be fitted. Anyway, it's not a responsibility that most people would be prepared to shoulder. It can be gruelling work and of course, there is no reward to speak of. Yeah, sometimes I do get depressed, very low. When I'm really down, it amuses me to toy with this notion, that one of the little people might discover the truth. Discover not only that their freedom is a delusion, but that furthermore, instead of being the hapless tool of some great deity shoved up on a towering titan-type cloud, they are instead jerked this way and that by a pervert in Bloomsbury or a dullard in the Shell Centre or an old incontinent in Clapton. Yes, it would be droll. I'm sorry? Yes, yes, that's right, that's what I was leading up to. When it gets too claustrophobic at home, when mother's rasping snore gets to me and the old woman's smell of flannel, medicaments and cabbage is making me wretch, I come here and engage someone like yourself in, in conversation. Someone bright, inquiring and, and interesting. And, and then I, I do tell them, I, I tell them everything. What, what's that? Yeah, yes, of course you are, you are perceptive. Naturally, I can do this with impunity because you'll, you'll never remember anything I've told you. It will depart from your tiny mind when we part. For as I told you at the outset, there are really only eight people in London. And whereas I am fortunately one of them, you are emphatically not.